Thank you, Nora. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, my voice doesn't get yeah, Can you hear me? Down there? Yeah, okay. All right, cool. So, like Dora said, I'm Manil Masme. I lead the uh, Earth Science Informatics Technical Channel with, uh, with Jeffrey Allen and Peter, who's not right here. I heard uh, yesterday was exciting, so hopefully we can keep this uh, today and tomorrow as exciting as yesterday. So, um, this is fourth year, right? Fourth year, right? That we're doing this, and yeah. we've been part of this for um, the last four years. And we've been trying to change as the technology has been changing in terms of the lessons. So hopefully this is as up to date as some of you might have uh, been working towards. So a very high level goals. Uh, so obviously we're continuing this series of capacity building around uh, technology related to AI and how high performance computing uh, plays a big role in it. Especially on the large models like the vision side, foundation models, and the large language models. The language model is a new thing that we're adding this year. We've seen in the last year and a half a lot of uh, usage of it in, in, in the downstream, not the downstream, the upstream side of the data, right? Uh, where data stewards, data management, a lot of uh, applications of that in that area. And that's a new piece that's going to be the focus tomorrow. Uh, today we'll focus on the, the US special foundation model. Uh, hopefully this will provide a forum for all of you to exchange ideas, meet new people. The goal is the collaboration, right? That's what we're here. So this is purely from the NASA side, what we do. Uh, we do science, right? We foster science, we support the community to do science. We have five science divisions, and one of them is Earth Science, and that's gonna be the focus today. So typically what happens in, in uh, science research is you have the science life cycle, right? you have observation, you collect data, and that's what we do, we send missions to space, uh, airborne missions, ground missions, field, field campaigns, all of that collect data, right? And you have a set of questions that you want to formulate into a hypothesis. If you do experiments, you set up experiments, you do data analysis, that's where a lot of progress in the geospatial function model has happened in the data analysis, but right? scaling that. Uh, and then you write publications that language model probably plays a part in there too. So this is cycle. The center of that gravity is data, right? You need data to do this science research life cycle. And here also we've seen a lot of progress in terms of uh, language models, in terms of supporting this data, data life cycle, which we're going to talk about more. So much of the progress, at least on the NASA side, has been in the last decade has been on the supervised learning side, right? You have you have a curated label, based on our scale, you train a model, and you iterate over it, right? And we've done this uh, in, in I think second second year of uh, our uh, our summer school was focused on supervised learning. And you deploy models, and you have new data coming in. It uh, starts to drift, and you train with the new data. We iterate this over time. And this is the paradigm we've used in NASA or even community has used for the last decade. Which works, right? Works really well. And in 2020, we ran a workshop in, in DC uh, bringing together most of our uh, user community working on Earth science, talk about how AI is advancing Earth science. Two main outcome of that uh, meeting, a workshop, is this issues related training data? It's a big bottleneck, right? It's very expensive to curate one. And if you once you curate it, it doesn't generalize beyond that particular application, right? You usually have an application in mind, you curate the data, train the data, you train a model. That model usually doesn't generalize, or the data doesn't generalize over other applications. So we're thinking, how can you solve this problem, right? And that's where the foundation model comes into play. Right. 20, 20, 2017, there was a paper, transformer paper, which probably should have been a requirement before this, this workshop um, or this summer school. Uh, is the attention of this all unique paper. And that started a whole chain of language models, large language models. And nowadays, uh, you can't go by without like two weeks not hearing about a new language model, right? Uh, the vision side of things about three, lags three years behind, but still, uh, there's a lot of, a uh, lot of, uh, progress in that area too, and you can see uh, how to use this, but this is the Prithivi model which uh, IBM Research and NASA collaborated, and that's going to be the topic of uh, hands-on 
session today. So very high level how this works, right? How, what is foundation model, what's the benefit of it? So I already mentioned the, the typical way of doing things, right? You have application-specific model, application-specific training data set. So we're moving away from that. It's very expensive, doesn't generalize, uh, but can we go into this kind of model where you use a label set of data set, right? You don't need training data set to build a foundation model. And once you, you can feed in different types of data. Once you have a foundation model, there are three ways you can use it. Some, some foundation model will work as is for your application, and that's a zero-shot learning. Uh, you can also train it to create your own model by just showing few examples, right? And that's a two-shot uh, two learning. And typically what ends up happening is you take the model weights and tune it using your own small set of training data set, and that's the fine tuning, and that's uh, going to be discussed later today. Uh, today. So advantage, I already mentioned, uh, there are quite a few examples. A lot of our science data is time series data, which works very well with uh, transformer architecture. Uh, obviously, we want to create a foundation model so that researchers don't have to spend a lot of time. They can have a starting point, a foundation, to build their application, right? And it takes very little resources compared to the old way of doing things. So earlier I showed a circle. This is a flattened version of, of that uh, life cycle. So on the upstream side, the data stewardship and management side, we have a lot of tasks, right? Mundane, repetitive tasks that our data stores do. You have standard data product generation. You have to ingest and archive properly. For that, you need metadata. You have documentation so that people can uh, understand what the data is about, how they can use it. And ultimately, you have to discover and access that you have for the search interface. That's where the language models are very, very useful. On the downstream side, it's, a lot of the focus is around scaling our traditional data class data classification, detection, prediction, even doing similarity search, uh, and anomaly detection. All of that is based on science foundation model. One of that example is geospatial foundation model. So this is what we are looking at, at least in NASA, and it mostly applies across space agencies as well. So uh, looking at how we have approached things, right? we usually start with science goals, because we are a science agency. And ask them. We start with science goals. We bring together scientists. Then we have these three main blue boxes there, right? You need data. They identify the data that is useful to create the application for. You obviously need a lot of compute, and that's what we are here today because uh, computing without compute, nowadays when you go build models, what do they ask, right? It's not about funds, it's about compute. Do you have GPUs? That's the first thing they ask. And then you need this foundational AI expertise, right? It's not about taking a model like a model and applying it. It's with the science data, you need a very special set of skills to be able to build foundation models. And in NASA, we're doing this openly, right? We do everything in the open. And that has worked very well for us uh, in terms of having community, uh, community evaluation of this, how it can be useful for the community. That's all done in an open collaboration way. And this Setting is one of our things, right? Where we come and training is a big part of uh, this open collaboration because it's fundamentally shifting how people are doing AI, not starting from scratch. Fine tuning is a, is, a, is a skill that you need to teach, right, from traditional ways. So, very high level, I think uh, Carlos can talk about this model in detail. Very high level, we build up this uh, first geospatial foundation model named Physibi using the harmonized data set dataset in collaboration with IBM. IBM provided uh, AI expertise and the compute, two main boxes of that earlier uh, chart you saw, and NASA provided the data expertise, the science expertise, and all of, all of it was done in collaboration. So you might say, why we picked uh, HLS, right? So HLS is uh, the second most popular data set in NASA archive. It is cited about 8,000 times. This is about a year and a half old. Uh, already people have downloaded two petabytes plus of data from our archives. And it, the reason, one of the reasons it's so useful for application is it provides two to four day global coverage of the entire Earth in about 10, 10 to 30 meter resolution. So this animation shows how it's uh, 
two, two sensors, the center of two, and lens are can be used interchangeably. So some of the applications, you can see the wide range of applications that are being used for, that uh, operationally being used for fire information at NASA. Uh, it, it has been used for water detection in the reservoir, fire detection, snow detection, a lot of different kinds of modeling applications, like urban planning, um, and it's been on the news quite a bit as well. So it is an ideal case for, for foundation model because once it's been used a lot, and it's been used for different types of application. So those are all fine-tuning kind of settings that you can use it for. Some of the highlights, when we first released, there were about three custom applications we published, um, and one, one of them required about 80% less training data sets than the original application did to get to the same level of accuracy. So you see a lot of savings in, in that regard, right? And uh, this is also old. There was about 80 plus downloads from the Hudson page where we have published this. It's been used for many different types of challenges. And one of the nicest things doing it in the open is this last bullet where uh, you use computing center. Uh, we're using a collaboration with them openly to scale this model. We only used uh, one year's worth of data to build the initial model. And we have now nine years worth of data. So we're using the entire nine years worth of data and globally trying to scale it, and I think uh, it's an active ongoing project uh, there. So just one note here that <coughs> in the open allows you to do this broad collaboration um, that we haven't thought it would have. So I'm not going to go into detail of this, but this is what is happening at ULIC. Uh, we, we started with a mass, mass autoencoder uh, technique to build an initial foundation model. We're trying out different uh, because things change over time, right? This has been more than a year now, so uh, we're seeing whether we can use a different architecture to, uh, to get better performance. And there's also a new, new capability being added in terms of generative uh, capability on predicting the next image kind of uh, approach uh, with the new architecture. Uh, there's also a new sampling strategy being uh, applied because you but you cannot put every single pixel of nine years of data into the function model, right? So uh, some stratified sampling is being uh, addressed here using both the spatial and temporal side of things. Because things like, for example, in Siberia, things don't change much, right? You don't need to include every single uh, day or every single pixel from there for, for nine years. So I said we use three applications, right? These are the burn scar, flood detection, and crop classification. We started with that, but a lot of things have happened since then. People have used it for uh, the, the cloud gap filling, uh, a lot of uh, new, in uh, new innovative applications on land to land change, uh, the eddy covariance. I think some of these are uh, ongoing. But two, the two bottom ones are kind of interesting. They reached out to us. Uh, this one, the locust breeding ground prediction, is a group in Africa. They, used the, they took the model and they developed this, uh, this locust, where the locust uh, will breed next. This food security is a big deal there, right? So this uh, helps address some of these, uh, some of these uh, challenging questions. And they, they have a really nice uh, feedback to the open source community. They actually put this back into the open source community so that others can use it. So nothing we thought of when we started this project that people would use it in this way. So hopefully you all can develop your own application after, uh, after today's exercise as well. So weather and climate is the new foundation model we just announced uh, about two weeks ago. And this is, Carlos, you're going to talk about this too, right? Or you are? Okay, so I'm not going to uh, mention very much about it, but this is beyond, going beyond forecasting. This is truly a foundation model that can be used for multiple applications. And we're not going to do the hands-on part here, so uh, maybe next year we can do this hands-on, right? So this is really cool. So this is a downstream, downstream application from uh, IBM using the foundation model for weather forecast. It was trained on NASA's uh, MERA 2, 40 years of NASA MERA 2 data set, but now you can use it to downscale um, something like the Eurocortex data set, which is from European 
Um, I, I think this is 12x uh, downscaling. So truly, uh, you can see it visually, right, the, the results. So large language model, that's the next part, tomorrow's uh, focus. And this is also a partnership between uh, NASA and IBM Research. We actually started our foundation model work with language model uh, several years ago. It wasn't a foundation model, it was just a natural language processing work there, but it has advanced ever since. The idea here is that can we, we started uh, looking at general foundation models, language models, and when you apply that to science domain, it really didn't work very well. Right, so there was a need to build a custom uh, model for science, and this was this effort. So we brought together all the science, the NASA science domain, like there are five, five divisions to build this model and with the help of IBM research. So we ended up building with two, two models, both uh, non-generative kind of models, because there's still an issue of using generative AI for, for science, right? There's some hesitancy. So there are two models we'll talk about in detail tomorrow, but they all they both provide uh, <coughs> kind of applications. Uh, one very uh, useful for uh, named entity extraction. The other one is uh, very useful for uh, information retrieval and application. But the value here is they actually putting together this curated set of data set to actually evaluate and train the model. And this is some sketch of how we are envisioning to use this model in, in, uh, in our application, right? There's a lot of question answering kind of approach. There's also combining this with a geospatial foundation model to do inferencing on real time based on human language interface. Uh, going back to the <coughs> principles of how we do things, it's all based on open science principles. We involve our science teams from the beginning all the way to the end, and we do everything. We, and we do that so that we have extreme transparency in terms of the approaches we choose. Any architectural changes that we do will have to be vetted by the science teams and it's evaluated. I just wanted to, I'm sure everybody follows here the AI uh, index chart, right? I want to bring a couple of charts here uh, why we do things the way we do things, right? So this is 2022, look at the number of AI papers, like 243,000 papers. It's not possible for one group to stay on top of AI progress, right? So it helps to partner with others. Another chart, you see, this is, uh, this is the, uh, the compute and, and the model size. Uh, you see, it's dominated by two, three companies, right? So how can academic and government come into play? And finally, this chart, the foundation models, number of foundation models, right? You see, again, dominated by two or three companies, and you see there's no government here. There's two universities, Berkeley and Stanford, right? This is science foundation model, and those are not science foundation model either. So there's a room here, there's a, there's a gap, and there's an opportunity here for all of us to work together to build the foundation model. So I, earlier I showed the supervised way of doing things, right? So one thing that has happened with the foundation model is this value of small data, right? I talked about the reduced amount of data needed to do uh, AI. So basically the approach now with smaller data is all you need is some prompts, right? All you need is maybe 10% of the original data. Then you have your model. So what's happened is to build a foundation model, you, you need like open large collaboration like we are doing. Once you have that model to do this Jurosat fine tuning or few shot learning, individual researchers can do this, right, with a, with a couple of GPUs. And you need, uh, instead of a uh, labeled data set, large labeled data set, you need unlabeled data set. And this is very small data set that you're working with. So paradigm has changed quite a bit in terms of resource needs for for building new, new models. So uh, finally, for plan for today and tomorrow, this is what we're trying to do, and this is uh, Ishan Kumar basically doing most of the work here. Uh, so we're going to touch on both fine-tuning language model and fine-tuning uh, geospatial model, and hopefully we can combine that in, in one of the final outcomes where we can do human language interface to actually getting information out of uh, geospatial foundation model. We're just going to try and see how it goes. 
Uh, but hopefully you learned a lot uh, by doing this exercise and we're going to keep the system open, right? Or, So key takeaways, uh, hopefully you all learn a uh, lot more about language model and foundation model and how to do analysis using those combined. Uh, is that the time my time? <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost done. Uh, maybe I can move on to this. So maybe final takeaway that you learn something new, right? And you maybe go back and do some research and it, it opens up some, some ideas for you to do more research. Uh, you need potential collaborators. We have IBM, NASA, Visa, UDA, of course, uh, uh, USC here. And hopefully, if you have questions, please, uh, we will we'll have our uh, group open to listen to all of your questions. And even after this uh, summer school, please reach out to us if you have any questions. And above all, you have a good time, hopefully, like last night. Uh, hi everyone, so uh, I'm Carlos and uh, together with Thomas uh, we're here from IBM Research in Zurich um, and yeah we would like to uh, talk to you a little bit more in depth uh, maybe on the technical details of what Manil has, has introduced already on the work we've done for uh, foundation models for the Earth observation model which is the one you guys are going to be playing with later today um, and talking a bit about the weather model as well uh, that's going to be uh, be developed uh, going forward now. Um, so first, maybe I wanted to just probe the room a little. Like, uh, how many people have heard about autoencoders or know about autoencoders? Okay, a few. And what about transformers? Or you know how transformers work? Okay, cool. So uh, that, that helps me a bit. So yeah, um, like Manil was introducing, um, we've seen sort of a shift maybe since the 80s, on how we work with data and extract intelligence from data. Um, we can see that maybe in the beginning, um, expert systems were, were what was more common, so sort of hand-designed rules by experts um, that try to themselves look at the data and try to make intelligent systems uh, from that, that knowledge that's maybe derived from their own. Um, and gradually through the years, we see a shift where what happened is we tried to almost let the data speak more and more for itself, rather than trying to impose our own inductive biases on these models, um, or things like this. Um, and we're seeing this uh, sort of ramp up, and we've seen this ramp up now um, with the rise of self-supervised learning at scale. Um, so things like all these chat GPT models, um, which really, the idea being try to trying to um, take these huge repositories of data, which have no labels, um, and trying to learn from them, trying to learn the structure of the data automatically, um, so that we can then derive a lot of models from this sort of, all of this knowledge that we've gathered from this data. Um, and yeah, what I'd like, I'd like to, to talk to you about is sort of how we can do this and how we did this in particular for uh, the Earth observation model, and then how you guys are gonna be able to play with it to, to train your own models. Um, so yeah, just a little bit of further motivation. So the satellite imagery is sort of a, almost an ideal playground for this because we have you know, ridiculous scales of data. Um, but if you want labels, as I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, they are very scarce, they're hard to get by, and maybe they're also localized uh, in regions that can afford to pay for labels. So it's very hard to take this and, and sort of generalize across the world. Um, and so the idea that, that we'll be talking about is to sort of take this, the train this central model that can take data and, and really produce useful embeddings. So throughout the presentation, throughout the day, when we're talking about embeddings, sort of what we're talking about is a, a representation of the data in a vector space which is useful for multiple tasks. And that's what we really want, is to have a model which can produce a useful representation of the data, which can then be used directly or, or tuned a little bit to many different tasks. So we really want to extract uh, all the knowledge we can from, from this data. And so how do we do this? 
So we first need to go through a, a pre-training step, which uh, does not use labels, and where our goal at the end of this pre-training step is really to achieve an encoder, which is uh, this model that's able to go from the image domain to the vector space and produce these useful uh, embeddings. That's really our goal. Um, and all the rest that, that we're going to talk, to talk about that builds around this encoder is just sort of a means to this end. And so in particular, um, that's why I sort of was, was probing the room before, um, what we use is this framework called uh, masked autoencoding, uh, where the model is a transformer. So I can uh, maybe just do a very quick introduction on, on, on transformers and how they work. So um, the, the transformer is really like sort of what's revolutionized and made possible this huge uh, AI boom recently. Um, and it's a model where um, what happens is you, you take your data and you divide it up into what's usually called tokens. And a token, you, you know, it's not important to go into too much detail, but it's going to be basically the main computational unit that this model is going to use. So, uh, for example, in the text case, which is where the transformer originated, um, you start from, let's say, a sentence that you want to pass to your GPT, um, and you're going to chunk this sentence down into tokens. They're not necessarily words, but you, you can think of them as words for this case. Um, and for each of those to words, you're going to map them into a vector. So now you started with a sentence, and you ended up with a list of vectors, or so-called tokens. And now in the model, those tokens are going to interact with each other through this mechanism called attention. And they're basically going to, you can think of these vectors as like in some very high dimensional space, and they're going to be rebalanced and recombined. And you can think that each of them is basically trying to represent what this word is and how it interacts with every other word. And then in the end, you're able to predict the next word based on these vectors that have sort of been interacting with each other. And so this transformer model is the sort of main backbone of our model. Um, but we're not dealing with sentences, right? We're dealing with images. So for this, we use what's called a vision transformer, where the idea is really quite simple. Uh, it's like we have these transformer models. They work amazingly for sentences. How should we use them for images? And the central idea here is we don't have words. So instead, let's take our image. Let's break it into chunks of 16 by 16 pixels. And now each of these chunks, let's treat them as if they were words. Instead of taking a word and uh, creating a vector from it, let's take this 16 by 16 chunk and make a vector from it. And then everything else works almost exactly the same as if you were dealing with sentences. So this is the main idea. I hope you're, you're still with me on this. OK, I see some notes. Um, and so great, now we have a model that, that we take uh, several time steps with uh, and several spectral bands. We break them into these chunks, we pass them into uh, our encoder, which is a transformer, and then we have this decoder side, um, which is going to try to, to reconstruct this original data. And now comes in the mass autoencoder part. So if you're familiar with autoencoders, you know that what they try to do is take the input data and then reconstruct them exactly. Um, and this has been, have been used for some time to try to also get these uh, encoder models which are able to, to produce useful representations. With self-supervised learning, the idea is we don't have labels, so we try to sort of create our own labels for the model to, or our own targets from the data for the model to learn. And in this case, the task that we give the model is very simple. We're going to take the input data and we're going to be quite mean. We're going to, you know, from these sort of 16 by 16 patches that we create, we're going to mask like 75% of them. So the vast majority of these patches, the model will not be able to see. And we're going to take the ones that are left and pass them through the encoder, which now hopefully produces a nice, useful representation of all the data. And now the model is going to have to reconstruct all of the patches that we've masked. And so, sort of the intuition behind this is you can think that just by doing this task, in order for the model to be able to reconstruct this data, it has to develop a good understanding of the sort of correlations between, between data, uh, of what the, the, the inherent structure of this data is. Um, and so in reality, we don't really care too much about the, the reconstructions. As I said, that's like a mean to the end, and the end is to get an encoder which is able to produce these really, really good uh, representations. 
So this is sort of the, the idea. And uh, so we, we developed this model together with NASA, um, and we've open sourced this version, which is available on Hugging Face, which is the, the version that uh, you guys are going to be playing with. Um, and if you go on Hugging Face, we also have these uh, demos on uh, Hugging Face Spaces, <laughs> where you can sort of pass your own model, your, your own data to the model, and see what happens. So for example, here you can see uh, on top was the initial data, and this part in the middle is what the model is. <laughs> and uh, oh, this work. Okay, uh, and in the end, you can see the, the reconstructions that the model uh, tries to come up with. Um, and so this is publicly available, and, and if you're interested to play with it without necessarily getting into the code, um, you can you can do it here. Cool. So after this uh, first step, we have a model that, as I said. You can give him, you can give it data, and you can see what it reconstructs. But this is not really very useful. We already have the data, right? What we really want is to then take this encoder and do useful things with it. Um, and here comes the fine-tuning uh, stage, where you're able to take a much smaller amount of data, which is labeled and is specific for the task that you want. Um, and we're going to then do a, a supervised learning step on this encoder together with uh, what we call a decoder. Um, when I say decoder, do people know more or less what I, what I mean by it? Okay, uh, maybe if you not. So basically, you know, we start with the uh, input data, and after passing it to the encoder, we have a vector representation of this data. So let's say your task that you want is scene classification. You want to know if it's, you know, what, what land class uh, are we talking about in the scene. Um, and so what we need is something that's going to go from this vector representation to a label. And this is what the decoder does. It's sort of an additional module that, that's specific for that task. If you were doing image segmentation, which I think you might be doing later, uh, then you would use a decoder which can, from this vector, produce a segmentation task. So a sort of image to image task. Uh, and this is how we achieve the, the versatility through these different decoders. So yeah, you can see, you know, we've, we've tried with a variety of different tasks. Uh, and depending on the decoder that you use, you can do uh, semantic segmentation, you can do multi-class semantic segmentation, uh, you can do data retrieval, you can do, you know, scene classification or, or regression as you have there, there in the bottom. Um, so we have quite a, a versatile framework to, to tackle different tasks. Uh, and here we have a few numbers on the example that, that Manil was mentioning, this is flood segmentation. Um, where what we've done is we've taken this Simon Floods 11 uh, data set and we've used it to fine tune the model. Um, and you can see that here on this plot on the left, what happens as we reduce uh, the amount of data. So, you know, with uh, an 87% reduction, so only actually 32 labeled images, uh, you can see that the model actually still uh, manages to, to perform very well. So that's one of the advantages. And the second advantage is on the plot on the left. Um, this line on the top is what happens when you start with a pre-trained model um, versus a non-pre-trained model. And you can see that the, the convergence is much, much, much faster. Um, so in terms of data efficiency and in terms of compute efficiency, uh, you actually get a, a lot of advantages. And yeah, I think we have a little video of uh, what we do here. So, so this is an example of how we can use this uh, in deployment in, uh, in real world scenarios. Uh, so here we have a flood and you can do, you know, this is the output of our, of our model's prediction. And then uh, a lot of the value comes when you mix this in with data that you already have. So for example, what happens if you have, uh, if you know the regions that have been flooded and you intersect them with regions where you know there are crops, well now you have some intelligence about uh, crop damage. Or with building maps, you might have building damage, for example. Um, and with the same backbone, uh, we also apply this for uh, burn scars, in this case in Greece. I think there were some fires last year. Um, and where our model can take the input data um, and recognize where there are burn scars. So regions that have been left behind as uh, damaged because of the fire. Um, and again, if you intersect this with, with maps, some intelligence that you already have on the ground, you can really extract the very useful insights about which crops have been affected, which buildings have been affected. Um, and so this is where you can really like, extract uh, some useful intelligence. Cool. And then uh, after this, we have the, the inference step, um, where you can apply to, to different data. And now, actually, I don't know how much time I've been going on for. Do you have time for the, the talk? 
Yeah? Okay, cool. So yeah, um, I just wanted to show you guys very quickly a sort of hands, a more hands-on part kind of, uh, of what you can expect to do later today. I think this is what you'll actually be doing on, so this will be just a, a little preview. Um, but basically, together with the model, we also open sourced a small toolkit that uh, uh, should help you in fine-tuning the model, and it's what you'll be using later today. Uh, and we have also this little exploration notebook here that sort of shows you, um, in, in more practical terms, what the model is doing. This is working, okay. Um, and so you can see, if you've worked with PyTorch before, um, this is really just sort of a PyTorch model that you can take and, and do whatever you want with it. Um, you, you can you know, simply load the weights so that the class, the Python class that you need to work with it is made available. Um, the hyperparameters to load the model are made available, and of course the weights. Um, and this notebook should really let you, you know, experiment with what the model is doing. So for example, here we have a multispectral image with the six bands, and it's 224 by 224. And this is one of the example images that from, from HLS. Um, and we can see what happens uh, when the model is chained. So uh, what happens is you, you pass it the amount that you want to mask the image by, so the proportion of patches that are going to be masked. Uh, and you can see on the left here we have the, the input image, uh, and you know we're going to mask it, mask out half of the pics of the patches, and you can see that the model uh, reconstructs it here. Um, so it will never be an exact reconstruction, and this is maybe not even the goal, but you know through this process this is how the model learns. Um, and similarly, the, the fine-tuned models are also available on Hugging Face. You can also download them and, and use them. Um, and in this case here, we have the example for, for the flood model. Um, so I just downloaded an image here to do, to do inference on. I believe this is somewhere in Spain. Um, and you can see what happens when we pass it through. As we start with the input image, um, and the model is able to segment the floods here. Uh, and this is just a little overlay. Um, so yeah, this can be like a good way to get started playing with the model if you're interested. Um, and yeah, later on you're going to be, be fine-tuning the model for, for your own use case. Cool. I think that that's all I have for my part. And I'll pass to Thomas to talk about the Weather Foundation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a, yeah, so this is a good question. Dora was asking, um, can we fine tune the model with different number of bands or different resolutions? Um, so the model that, that we have open source now, it's been trained on uh, six different bands. These are RGB, uh, SWIR 1, SWIR 2, and near infrared. Um, so from these, you can be pretty confident that you can start it. If you have less bands, it's not a problem. You can train on a subset of them. If you have more bands than this or a different set, you can still do it, but you should expect that the model will take a little bit longer to converge. Um, so for during the fine-tuning process, the model can accept uh, bands that it has not seen before, and it will learn the interaction between those and the ones that it has. Struts, uh, the model struts uh, some of the bands, five or six, or uh, includes all the information that you provide? Yes, it will include all the information you oh, provide. It just, it's never seen it before, so the fine-tuning process may take longer. And the convergence could be... Uh, I guess it depends, but we've done this successfully with the first Try. Yeah? With our data, yeah? Okay. So we do not have to handle the number of bands on our own if we just uh, handle the number of bands. Yes, uh, from a coding point of view, you might need to do a little bit of rounding, but from a like learning point of view, the model uh, is able to. Yeah, okay. Because we are having problems with some rich terrain uh, models right. uh, using data, for example, obtained with very high resolution with uh, a sensor board, uh, IUAU, for example. Mm. And in these cases, the convergence is not good and the results are not very good. Yeah, yeah a good uh, yeah. way of. of yeah, the resolution is also a tough thing. I mean, the model is trained on 30 meter resolution. If you try to pass it 30 centimeter resolution, no, no, it might struggle a little bit. No, today. not too high. It depends. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. How much time do we have? How much time do we have? 10 minutes. Yeah, that's good. Okay, cool. Um, right, so. Let's change topic. So now I'd like to show you kind of some insights about the Weather and Climate Foundation model, which Manny had mentioned kind of was released uh, two weeks ago. Um, so basically here, 
Um, we extend kind of from the Earth observations towards kind of the atmospheric sciences and are kind of happy to show you first results. But first, kind of also let's see what happened in that domain. Kind of last year, I think there was the ChatGPT moment in the weather forecasting world. So AI emulators showed skills similar to the numer numerical weather prediction models. So kind of these physics-based PD type of models which are used by the weather forecasters everywhere on the planet. So AI emulators have shown similar skills in forecasting up to 10 days ahead. And the interesting thing is here, and that's kind of shown here, so that there's the different types of models, like forecast, angle weather, draftcast, etc. You get a speed up in inference time by four orders of magnitude. I mean, this is substantial. So compared to running your calculation on a cluster, could do it on a single road. So that's really great. Um, of course, you have to train the model first, and we also try to see you know, what the different types of models, you know, how many the equivalent V100 GPU hours are required. I mean, you can go up to like Hangu to 300,000 V100 GPU hours. So, yes, training is expensive, inference is super cheap. And will allow you also to do that's kind of what the weather or climate people always do is kind of sampling, kind of running multiple cases, maybe with some perturbations from the initial conditions to get kind of uncertainty estimations. Um, so, but if, if kind of the training is expensive, you may want to think as well kind of about foundation models. So you train once, and you could use the model then for different downstream applications with a little bit of tweaking. So that's what we are trying kind of together with NASA. Um, the comparison is shown up here. So basically, let's say in the AI emulator world, kind of you would want to forecast kind of the next time step. So here are your input variables, and here we, just by the way, let's before we just talk about the channel for Earth observation. So there we are considering six channels for the Pretty model, and here for the MIRA2 data, so MIRA2 is kind of the NASA data set, it's, it's a reanalysis data set, so basically it's kind of taking into consideration all the observations about the atmosphere and recomputing kind of on a grid what happened. So basically you have a perfect data set, like 40 years on a very nicely gridded kind of atmospheric, I mean with the, with the different parametric levels and then kind of spatial. So you have a perfect data set, uh, which can be beautifully used kind of to, to train the uh, NEI emulator. So basically, uh, with kind of um, the atmospheric variables at time zero, you predict them kind of the time step uh, one and then two and so on. And then you, you look at kind of again the RMSC for instance, of, of uh, kind of prediction and then kind of the, the data set. Okay, but for the foundation model, kind of this task is uh, too simple, so you could only use the model for the forecasting, but you may want to use it for uh, downscaling, mm -hmm. kind of increasing resolutions of climate predictions, for instance, for local uh, weather pattern. Um, and here we, we've chosen kind of a task where, again, we have kind of the spatial masking as introduced by the colors. So, I mean, all these variables, it's 22 variables we are considering, like let's say it's 22 bands. And, equivalent in that sense, we are asking, but then also, uh, which is a bit hard to see here, but we, we also kind of do predictions into the past, but also into the future, and also at the same time step. So kind of here, this reconstruction task is more diverse compared to the usual AI emulators, and that's kind of how we hope, and that could show kind of that the model could be uh, more versatile for different downstream applications. Um, Furthermore, kind of, uh, we, kind of with the transformer models, we have this tokenization procedure going. And you can imagine now here we are talking really about uh, the entire world. I mean, we have MIRA2, we have kind of the data from the entire world, it's gridded. And kind of with the tokenization strategy we have here, kind of, we, uh, kind of the model is then independent on kind of the patch size. So we can have different resolutions. But then also we can be fle flexible in the sequence length. And, and it's really beautiful if you want to do uh, not global, but like local high resolution or super resolution tasks. So you can then zoom in. Or it also allows you 
let's say if you have observations, typically these observations are not on the grid of Mira 2. What we are now is this data. If you have a wind farm here or a solar farm where like solar radiation would play a role, then you want to have uh, kind of specific point locations being evaluated. So that's kind of the, the flexibility you have with the tokenizations and the transformer architecture, which allowed us kind of to uh, demonstrate uh, the initial kind of downstream tasks. One is kind of time, uh, kind of downscaling. So I have just a video afterwards, uh, Manu mentioned. So you have kind of typically kind of these uh, you know climate projections in six. So they're typically on a course resolution of something like 100 kilometer, but then you have like a local, let's say for Europe, it's this uh, Euro, Euro, uh, Euro cortex data set which has a higher resolution, so that's kind of what we, that's how we um, fine tune the model and you get a 12x kind of ground scale. But then also we, we demonstrated kind of off-grid wind forecasting for some wind farms in Brazil. And NASA is working on Kind of the hurricane uh, type of downstream task, it's extremely weather event. And so here is kind of the example of, of the downscaling uh, in Europe. So this is the precipitation on kind of the fairly coarse scale, and then kind of the 12x kind of uh, downscaling of, of this precipitation map. And the same kind of also for, for the temperature. So now how can we use kind of these models? And also how can we use both models in particular, right? Um, so here are an example, and I think we have quite some remote sensing colleagues here, I guess, or environmental scientists. So these may be uh, downstream tasks or workflows you are used to. But right. anyway, here, just to exemplify kind of how the Earth Observation Foundation model and the Climate Foundation model can really play hand in hand. So on, on one side, Let's say, for instance, for flood risks, you, you look back into the past, you know, flood extents from past events, and also building damage. You know, can be assessed by the Earth Observation Foundation model based on, you know, the HLS data set. For buildings, you may need a higher resolution. But there also kind of the temporal component from the pretty model uh, is very handy, because typically you want to have a pre- and post-event image to assess kind of. A semantic change. So that's not the upper branch. From there, you can infer kind of so called impact functions. So, kind of insurances are using, or researchers are there. Insurances are using these impact functions and to later assess kind of what uh, the probability of damage in the future would be. So, basically, this is kind of the, just a, a function between uh, kind of uh, hazard variable, for instance, flood depth or, or flood velocity and kind of observe damages. So that you learn from the past observations, but then you can use the Earth Observation Foundation model and the climate model uh, for also prediction. So basically here you use kind of the, uh, the climate projections. You do the downscaling to get higher resolution pre precipitation patterns, and then you run your hydrological models. Typically, hydrological models, they depend quite a bit on, on kind of soil, for instance, you know, kind of the local soil quality, you know, uh, about kind of the runoff of, of the water. So, and this again, you can couple to the observations from the past. So, to optimize for kind of the soil um, sponginess, kind of, in, in the specific regions, you can take kind of these local observations and you can collect them kind of land use and soil type. With this, you can then perform kind of a flood risk map, I mean a projection into the future with different climate scenarios, couple it with the impact functions, and for instance open street map, you have the assets labeled there, and you can make an estimation prediction in a, in a region kind of what, the, what the, the, the damage could be. Another example how to use kind of earth observation and, and the weather foundation model or the climate foundation model uh, this is a task um, our colleagues in the South Africa lab are tackling. So, uh, in uh, uh, NIH sponsored program uh, called uh, Heat Project. So, the intention there is kind of to identify urban heat die line and, and to identify the impact on humans and human health in particular. And so, they are kind of collaborating with the hospital. So, they have clinic and medical records at hand and also kind of the, the observations from, from the heat die lines. 
So from <laughs> exactly, so I mean, it's interesting, kind of always, kind of to, to see kind of how disparate kind of the resolutions are. Um, so basically, from the satellite side, we have you know 30 meter resolution, 10 meter, or maybe down to 30 centimeter. But then from the climate side, we, you know, we have maybe 25 kilometers if we are lucky from climate projection. So this means that we just have you know maybe one or maybe four pixels per, per area, right? So, but we want to combine kind of these two uh, data sets, right? So, for instance, here if it's it's about kind of the urban heat. Um, the satellite imagery, great. We have spatial resolution, but the temporal resolution um, is not so great if it comes kind of to really the uh, diurnal kind of cycle. Kind of over the day and night, we can get kind of these temperature variations. So here for the and uh, the weather prediction or climate prediction, we have like one hourly kind of information. So in the temporal domain, very high resolution, but spatially not. So, but then we combine kind of the two data set. So we uh, train kind of then the Earth Observation Foundation model with input from uh, the spectral satellite imagery and the, the two meter temperature from uh, the weather model. And predict kind of the uh, land surface temperature, and we do that at kind of this this point in time where satellite observations are available. But then, in inference mode, we can use kind of the closest spectral information and pair it with kind of the weather information from this very time step. And that's how we can uh, come up with higher resolution and and also with higher temporal resolution type of uh, urban heat island estimation and couple it then kind of eventually with. The clinical data. So yeah, I hope this gave you kind of uh, an overview of the Earth and the Weather Climate Foundation models and how potentially to combine. Um, as Manuel said, that so maybe next year, so maybe it's <laughs> just like a cliffhanger here. So stay tuned. Next year uh, there will be a fun session on, on the Weather Foundation model or maybe com combination uh, of most of the models. But yeah, for today, I think uh, have fun with Pretty and enjoy. Thanks. This is a combined uh, work which is going on in synergy with ML Commons uh, Crossover Working Group. So it's a big working group coming from people who are presenting different organizations like Google, Open Data Institute, uh, Meta, and uh, and many others. And there are few extensions which are already designed, like responsible AI extension. But there are a few extensions which are coming up and are new. So health extension and the geospatial one which we are working on. So this talks about the training data uh, standard and its representation format, not going towards the model part, but how uh, we can efficiently describe a data set. Uh, we can consider it as a replacement for data cards or data documentation, which we already know. But this is efficient in terms of the crossover representation can directly be used by any data loader. So yeah, let's start. So uh, crossover is a standardized metadata format. It was launched in March. Uh, the first version was launched in March. And uh, what it does is it uh, in the slide you can see that it is it can be useful for four basic purposes based on what kind of application you have. So for creators and maintainers of machine learning data sets, the work with data is tedious. Making ML-ready data sets is a big deal, and especially when you are talking about a new domain or when you are talking about Earth observation, which is having heterogeneous data sets, heterogeneous sources of data sets. So it becomes difficult to create or curate ML-ready data sets. So with that in mind, uh, that is the first principle, first design principle, which goes in development of Crossau. Uh, for ML researchers and practitioners, it is how, you, how, how they can directly use and easily use machine learning data sets, which are already curated by someone else and available on public platform. On the third end, how responsible AI can be incorporated into using machine learning data sets. So with the advancement in data centric machine learning and all the features which are coming in, uh, we need to be responsible about uh, 
what large language models are producing or what uh, output the foundation models are producing. So with that in mind, the RAI extension uh, is also there in the design principle. And lastly, for the policymakers. So when AI regulation emerges across the world with different policies coming up in Europe, different policies coming up in US, and different policies coming up in other parts of the world, so how there can be a standardized way to represent all the training data and uh, related data set information to uh, for the development of policy and other things so as i mentioned like in terms of implementation croso has these features like download search create and load and uh, from the download side it is integrated with most of the popular machine learning repositories like open ml kaggle hugging face uh, from the search side, it is implemented with Google Dataset Search uh, while working on creating. So whenever you are publishing your own dataset, there is a croissant editor which can be used for creating a croissant metadata file. And for loading, there are data loader support. So currently, I think TFDS, which is TensorFlow Datasets, already supports it. Very soon, Hugging Face Datasets and PyTorch data loaders will also be supported. Now, coming back to the main point of why, why uh, of how we can introduce geospatial data set into this and uh, what is what is the thing which we are proposing from the impact side. So uh, this is an example of all the operating and future science fleet, which is ongoing, um, which can which consists of ongoing missions and also future missions which would be coming in. So we are expecting a lot of data and it is already there, but it is expected that it is going to increase very much. With that in mind, and also our parallel efforts about implementing geospatial foundation models. So we came up with an objective like how we can define or how we can curate good AI ready data sets. So when I talk about AI ready data, it means that data which can directly be used by users or people for developing AI models for for implementing AI models on the data sets. It, these are not raw data. These are data which have been pre-processed, which have been scaled, normalized, and um, have been passed on through some steps for using to develop the geospatial, of, uh, geospatial foundation model. Now, when we talk about uh, geospatial data, we know that it is a bit complex. There are certain complexities with geospatial data sets. First of all, the, the, it is multidimensional. It has a lot of different dimensions. Um, depending on application, we can have multispectral or hyperspectral data sets. We have spatial and temporal dependencies. The data volume is crazy. It is too large to handle. And uh, the data quality, it plays a very important role. So noisy conditions or atmospheric conditions. And then heterogeneity of sensors. So we have uh, data coming in at a very continuous resolution. But on the other hand, we also have discrete data points which come from in situ sensors. And then there are scale variability as well. Apart from that, uh, a very important factor which is getting good attention in these days is privacy and ethical concerns. So ethical considerations when we are using geospatial data, for example, privacy and surveillance, given there have been satellites which are producing one meter resolution uh, images. So then the privacy and ethical concerns related to human and their uh, needs, uh, it becomes important. So with that in mind, and while defining a metadata standard, how we can come up with a standard which will be useful for AI data sets. Uh, I'll quickly go through this slide. This is an example which shows different kind of data sets and the hyperspectral, the famous Parvio University hyperspectral data set or the multispectral uh, data from coming from Landsat 8, the famous buoys data set which is used for uh, buoy analysis and ocean surface readings, then point cloud, LIDAR point cloud, then street view images, star images, and all of these have different resolution, different scale, or different way of pre-processing. Now, uh, when we boil, uh, when we try to divide it into simple features, these unique characteristics can be defined from the description, from the data description. 
So if we talk about resolution, we'll have spatial, spectral, all these uh, different types of resolution, bounding box, sensor and sensing type. And when we try to define this vocabulary, we will we, we can come up with different categories for all of these characteristics. And uh, sorry to cut short in between. Uh, am I still audible? Hello? Oh, Alvaro? Uh, we are listening. <laughs> we are here. Okay. 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 But we have the microphone mute in order to not create echo. So... Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah, I was talking about unique characteristics which define uh, the geospatial data in different formats. And when we talk about these characteristics, uh, we need to keep in mind that these can be used for defining any AI data dataset. But then most of these are not required and we can use some of these to do this. So what Crossaw does is, Crossaw is built on top of schema.org, which is a very huge vocabulary, which is a very huge, uh, schema defining all the different attributes or properties related to data sets which can be used and we are we are leveraging that for our use to come up with geocrossor which will be an extension of crossor so what it means is try to understand it like a big set of schema and then there will be one schema which will be using some properties of crossor schema and some properties which will be separate and defined under GeoCrossor extension, specifically for geospatial datasets. And this will cover machine learning datasets so that it, it becomes easy to work with geospatial machine learning or GeoAI uh, machine learning datasets. And uh, these are some examples which we can uh, think of, so resolution, bounding box, type of sensor, data model. And, and these are the things which are important from a metadata perspective going into a machine learning uh, ready data set and useful when we are when we are developing an AI model. Uh, one good example which I can think of is uh, the Prithvi Weather and Climate Foundation model, which we are working on with IBM Research and other collaborators. So in that case, if I give you one simple example, uh, for all the weather variables which goes into the model to be used as machine learning data set, they need to have scale and normalization features uh, because temperature has a different scale and pressure has a different scale. So when we are generating outputs, if we don't know about the scale and normalization values, we will be getting crazy output values. So to overcome that, these features need to go into the machine learning data set as, uh, as features as metadata description and can be used when we have got the inference results. Uh, one simple use case uh, which we have contributed to as part of this Crossaw uh, contribution was RAI extension. So there's a group which came up with responsible AI extension for responsible AI attributes whenever a data set, new data set is defined. And we have incorporated geospatial uh, angle to it. So uh, more details uh, can be like, looked into after going to the specification. But yeah, finally, uh, the main point. So what GeoCrossaw extension can be done, uh, can do. So Crossaw core and responsible AI extension, it helps in efficient representation of metadata and RAI attributes. It also enhances processing in an end-to-end -end workflow where we are looking for an automated end-to-end -end workflow. But it misses spatial reference information. It misses how nested data attributes such as the important files like NetCDF4, HDF5, or SAR file formats, which are uh, widely useful for geospatial problems, can be defined. It does not uh, include interoperability with existing cloud native geospatial data formats. It does not talk about geographical biases. So, with all that, all this in mind, we 
uh, RB have proposed a new GeoCrossor uh, extension and the working group meetings have just started and if anyone is interested then please reach out to us. The questions which we are asking are can GeoCrossor enable these like can we talk about geo coordinates and resolution awareness can we talk about geospatial data provenance temporal characteristics and responsible AI so these are some big bullet points which we are trying to cater via the GeoCrossor extension and we envision it to be useful across uh, all the machine learning EO data sets as a community standard uh, since it is a JSON format, like the metadata representation uses a JSON and JSON LD, the linked data format, uh, it enables data fusion of different data formats for machine learning data sets. So, for example, if there is a problem in which I have to include socioeconomic data sets with the satellite imagery, and both of them have inherent different way of storing so we can use it and fuse the data together using these metadata format and currently we are looking into expanding it across NASA science along with uh, all the members who are a part of the geocross working group and yeah and scope of development uh, so we are looking for interoperability we are looking for designing drafting a new specification and standard and just not only reproducing the existing standard but having something which will be useful from ai ready data perspective with respect to all the new geospatial foundation and large language models uh, which are coming up so how we can have a good standardized way to define those training data definitely develop a tooling for accessing these geocross extension and how we can define different EO use cases, Earth observation use cases from machine learning perspective. And finally, incorporate this into user-driven frameworks, user-driven geospatial processing engines, such as the Google Earth Engine or uh, VEDA, NASA VEDA or um, Microsoft Planetary Computer, which have all the data ingested and right from the data towards the visualization. So how we can bring geocrossor into that entire ecosystem and these are some resources so the blog post link the specification the responsible AI specification and also the paper which came up recently in the data engineering and management workshop uh, so if anyone is interested in being a part of the working group for geocrossor design and uh, development please reach out to manil who is there in the room or to me or Iksha or anyone. And yeah, thank you. I want to give you another perspective from the computer side. I mean, we have heard already from Manuel, Carlos, uh, Thomas, how much compute, I mean, compute, how important is compute when we want to build this uh, foundation model. So uh, I would like to give you more a perspective from you know, the HPC community. Uh, what does it mean for us to, uh, you know, to to help uh, this uh, these activities and these missions? So uh, for the outline, so I would like to first give you some, you know, points and you know, uh, history milestones in terms of the evolution of computing. Then I will move to uh, uh, how I explain how machine learning drives computational demands, and I guess until I mean, after this first presentation, you are aware that. Basically, having these applications from machine learning, foundation models, basically kind of rule the way how uh, supercomputers and machines are formed, so to be used now, all right? Because we need them to train these big models. Then I will go a bit on the supercomputing and parallel programming paradigm, and finally give you some details, some information about the Uli supercomputer. Okay, so computing technology has evolved in uh, recent decades, and uh, here I truly try to summarize uh, the different milestones uh, uh, in the microprocessor prime data, which basically shows you how, uh, from the beginning, more slow was driving the semiconductor industry to basically try to push and to place as many transistors as possible in the same volume. Then we had a phase which is called the end, the end of the end of scaling, where basically we started to have some problems in how we can actually put these devices 
and having some issues in terms of for example, uh, voltage and currents. Then we added to the multi-core area because then we say, okay, uh, we cannot really get a processor, a single processor faster and better. So what we do, we just you know stack more together, and this is what the era of uh, uh, parallelism basically. But then we also are countering uh, the threshold where actually uh, you you get to a point where actually parallelism uh, has also its own limitation, which is the Adams law. And finally, now we are in this phase where we have a new trend, where we basically are looking for different kind of devices for basically having dedicated devices stuck them together, for example, in modular, modular systems, where you really try to have hardware dedicated to uh, different applications, but uh, working together. So supercomputing, uh, basically you see here is another kind of, you know, uh, history of how things went. So we started from the very beginning where we had the first supercomputers specialized. They were expensive, of course, only few could have them in their lab. But then we had a phase where actually uh, we had basically from 1960 to 1980 uh, vector computers dominated the HPC, while general purpose computers um, start to came to the markets at the, at the lower price. Then you have the era of cluster computers from 1990 to 2000, where basically you started to have general purpose CPUs integrated in HPC systems. This was a more economical approach. And where we have now, they basically started to use MPI, so basically start to communicate and use library, communication library to exchange information between the different uh, processors. And finally now, uh, as I mentioned before, we are in this era of heterogeneous cluster system where we have now a uh, domain basically from uh, hyperscalers, so for example, here NVIDIA, where we have now uh, this accelerator that we use for, for training these models. And this is also, uh, let's say, reflected in the market, as you can see here, basically you see, for example, where the money are, right, so you have this uh, an interesting, let's say, side of the plot where you have this called hyperscalers, where basically HPC married uh, AI, and where you have basically all these, uh, uh, yeah, these bodies that I was already mentioning before, right? And then, of course, so India plays not uh, not a, a, a negligible uh, role here. And of course, uh, there is this interesting relationship between HPC and cloud computing. You see here, because of course, cloud computing is always available, uh, it's reliable, it's higher level programming. So, um, in the future, we are going to see more, uh, let's say, like these two communities getting closer and closer. Also, thanks to the fact that now we have this uh, application of uh, foundation model. Okay, so here is another plot, but just to show you, so uh, when we want to decide, you know, which is the best supercomputer, uh, we need to measure how it performs, so we use this, uh, um, this uh, metric, the flops, so the floating point separation per second, and that's how we decide uh, how much uh, performance, and basically you see here some milestone from 1997, we had the first uh, teraflop supercomputer, then we have two, 2008, the first uh, uh, petaflop supercomputer, Roadrunner. And, and you can see here again this technology, so sequential computer, vector computers, parallel computers, and now again in this new uh, era of architecture. And now we are in the era of exascale supercomputing, so this is what uh, we are dealing now since last year, um, when basically Frontier uh, finally reached the, the level. And as you can see, it's an interesting trend because we would expect that we would reach already exascale computing already in 2018. Actually, that was not the case. So you can see here that this program that I was mentioning before with the microprocessor, so I have this limitation in the in the parallel, uh, let's say, in the parallel regime, doesn't uh, give you that gain that it was giving you before. So now we need to find new ways, new technology, new accelerators to to make sure that we can still have this trend and uh, get faster and faster. Okay, so uh, it is clear also, I think we have seen this graph before, but basically from, let's say, this period where AlphaGo was published, we can say that we are in the large scale area, uh, where basically we have these trends, where we basically have these larger models. Um, you know, uh, this estimation, for example, uh, OpenAI estimate 3.4 to doubling, 
this estimation, of course, uh, but to see it, we will see in the future, but basically we can say that for the next years, uh, this is the, the current trend. So, foundation model, I will not repeat my, whatever has been said, so basically the three keywords are self-supervised learning, self-supervised presentation learning, multimodal learning, so you use this big model, um, already, let's say, well established in, uh, in, the, in the natural language processing, and you know, now all this, uh, let's say, achievement were done, but also now in the observation, as it was already mentioned. And of course, this brings to the fact that now supercomputers are more popular. So not like in the past, where only few companies could have could afford to have, or, you know, um, <clears throat> big techs, for example, could have actually these uh, the supercomputers. But now, let's say, uh, is getting more popular, like to get or try to to, to have this in their in their proper you know, institution. So we already mentioned what are the main steps to, to train a foundation model, right? So we have basically, we see a big role here of HPC where we need to do the, the job, the intensive job to get your model trained. And then basically when you're here for the fine tuning part, you can still rely on your resources that you might have, so GPU or like workstation or cloud computing. And basically, um, we will also, uh, let's say, in this training, and today we will, you will have access to our HPC system to do, uh, let's say, just the fine tuning, right? But what we did already, I mean, to get Prigny, the work was already done, right? So Prigny was already trained using HPC. So here just uh, some facts. So let's imagine we want to train the GPT-3 model. It was 175 billion, so that's a small model compared to what we have now. But if you would say that you wanted to, let's say, full train it on a, on a single ampere, 100, it would take you 90 years. Um, if you just sit and wait at the next technology, so NVIDIA Hopper 100, you will Still, you get the gain, right? By just doing nothing because technology advanced, but of course, still you will have to wait 30, 15 to 30 years. But uh, the, you know, the point is that uh, we, we don't want to use a single GPU, but we want to use as many GPUs as possible. And we have estimated that if we train this on our dual booster, our let's say current uh, fastest computer in, in, in Mulek, you will get this to 16 days by using 2000 GPUs. So, these are the numbers that we're talking about. Now, if we go to the GPT-4, uh, so 1.83 million weight parameter, these numbers are still uh, very high. Even if you use 2,000 GPUs, you still have to wait some days. <laughs> so, and that's why we are getting a bigger supercomputer. So to get these numbers smaller and smaller. But the models get bigger and bigger. So what is the, this, I don't want to enter philosophical now discussion, but uh, this is in the current trend. <coughs> All right, so supercomputing and parallel programming. So what is actually supercomputer? Well, we can mention it in this way. So it's a basically a parallel computer that can be only the way to achieve some particular goal. So to achieve this particular goal, right, so to have this foundation model trained, um, you need to rely on a, on a computer which you can have many different, let's say, workers, cores that work together, get the, uh, the, the, work, the work done. Okay, so basically, uh, what if someone asks you what is the main what what is the main difference between HPC and cloud computing? You just need to say that HPC basically has a very high speed interconnect, so it's a very reliable network which interconnect the different workers, the different models. So this is the main difference. All right, in cloud computing, you have still many workers, let's say, but they are loosely connected, right? So, the, 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 all the work that you, that the people that build supercomputer, uh, the main effort is put really in the interconnection between the different workers so that all the system can work in parallel in a most efficient way. Because at the end, you can imagine that the, the, what you want to avoid is to waste too much time in communicating information, right? You want to make this faster and make sure that you, know, uh, you just use the whole machine. Uh, in parallel and communicate only when it's possible and when you do it as fast as possible. So the building blocks. Um, basically, in a nutshell, uh, HPC system, you have uh, login nodes where you land, so when you do SSH or when you uh, start uh, to you know, you access the system, you will land 
and that will log in now. These are few nodes, it will be shared. And, and for that point, you will have to request uh, the usage of uh, the compute nodes, which is where the actual compute work. And of course, then you will have the storage part where you put you let's say put your data or the result of your mix. In terms of software, you will of course have an operating system that compiles library and the, and the scheduler. So basically, what happens is that okay, you have, a, you have a, something to compute. You will have to write a job script which we will submit in a in a in a in a, in a queue. And the system, when you know when the system is ready, when there are not you know enough, let's say when. You have times when the system has the possibility to submit your job, it will be done, and finally you will get, uh, you will get the result. So it's more about fire and forget. So it's not like you know, in an interactive, let's say, uh, approach where you know you, with your laptop, you know, you, you press the button, you get the result already, but this is more about, okay, I submit my job, and I will wait for the results when the machine is available. Because remember that these systems are shared with many different users, right? It's not your machine, it's shared, so there is a very sophisticated way of scheduling and allocate uh, your users. Um, at ULIC, we are also working a lot to make, uh, let's say, the access more, let's say, uh, easy for maybe uh, for users that maybe don't have expertise in, uh, in uh, for example, you know, using you know Linux commands, SSH, all this kind of stuff. So basically what you can do and what you will do is that you will access the system via your browser. So you just you know to be that JC, login, password and then you're left you're ready there. So that's actually how we uh, we envision that and having this connected to all our machines that very good. Okay, so you don't access only one machine but basically whenever you get allocated a specific project you can access the machine that you were reserved. And this is also true for quantum computing. So with this, we also have a Jupyter um, version that can access also this system that we get integrated. So this, so uh, about uh, training models, right, in parallel, basically these are the high level main categories. So, and you will use basically this one, data parallelism. So basically what happens is that you have your model and you put a replica of, of uh, the model on each GPU that you use, okay? And uh, each GPU will get some part of the data, okay? They will, they will train it in an independently and then finally they will merge um, the, um, the gradients. You have also more sophisticated, let's say, way of doing parallelism when, for example, the model doesn't fit on a single GPU, when the model is so big uh, that doesn't fit on a single accelerator, what you need to do is to split the model over different devices. Um, and this is not the case yet for foundation model in earth observation. So we can still rely on that first. And then, of course, you have more sophisticated, more different way of you know, doing it, for example, pipelining. And this is an active field of research, data parallelism, distributed training. Uh, so it's very, uh, very active. So if you're interested, I can also point to some papers where you can read more about you know, this. Okay, let me please spend a few words about the Ulysses Computing Center. So here you have it. It's a, a nice, let's say, campus in the middle of, I always say nowhere, but it's not true. <laughs> it's, it's just difficult to reach sometimes, but yeah, it's in between basically Cologne and Aachen, uh, so very close to the border with uh, the Belgium and the uh, Netherlands. And so we are basically a uh, yeah, national lab where we basically have supercomputers at different scale, we call tier. So it's a tier zero because we have supercomputers that get into this top 500 list. And, um, and, but then also we run also different other systems uh, for national level and regional level. Um, so the strategy has been the following. So as you can see here, we were starting in a monolithic way where we were just you know, focusing on a single, let's say, machine. But then we started to move into this dual phase where you have, let's say, cluster, which are more general purpose, mostly based on CPUs. While on the other side, you have what we call boosters, where we have now this uh, uh, more specialized machine for AI, for example, so having a lot of GPUs. And this was done, this strategy was developed through a series of European projects, the D projects. Uh, on the website, you can find a lot of information on how this was developed. And, but now, as you can see here, uh, we are approaching the exascale uh, area, and in this 
part basically we go what we say and we go modular so we don't actually just work on two different strategies but actually we expand so we have more components that are dedicated for the different application so um, in terms of system we have currently so we have as I showed you before we have the jewel system which is our fastest uh, system at the moment and basically what we are interested here for example is that, for example that we have more than 3,000 NVIDIA uh, Ampere 100 GPUs that we can use to, to train these models. Um, you will have access today to the Eureka VC. I will tell you a little bit about this system, which has um, yeah, 700 uh, NVIDIA Ampere 100 GPUs. So you're not going to use all of them, right? But you will have the possibility to run you know, the fine tuning on, on this, uh, on this uh, system. And, uh, and then Jupiter, so the new uh, Texas scale system, which will hopefully run by January, February 2025, uh, which will be the first Texas scale supercomputer in Europe. So Frontier already achieved the goal in the States. Now it's time for Europe to shine and having it also here. Um, so um, it's very important having this system well interconnected with the very high speed connectivity. This is the key, right? Because at the end, we want also to compute and move the data. And this is actually becoming the main bot, the main bottleneck. The main problem now is not is this compute, but it's also about data movement, data transferring. This is getting very problematic. So you will have access to your APDC. This is, uh, stands for data centric. Uh, this is uh, intended for missed capacity and cap uh, capability workloads. Um, it, it is now more like, let's say, a system where we used to also, you know, test different architecture, different uh, partitions. And uh, here you see the recent certificate in top 500 and 500. Um, so uh, you will have also here two kind of partition. Main partition one mostly on uh, CPUs where you have more than 500 compute nodes based on uh, AMD uh, CPUs. So here you find you know, the details, so you, uh, I think it's not really important. Uh, but uh, for example, for the, the cluster that you're going to use today for do the fine tuning, uh, this is the one that you're going to access, the, the GPU nodes, where you have exactly what I mentioned before, uh, the, Amo 100, uh, the Ampere 100 GPUs uh, to, uh, to do the fine tuning. And the login nodes, as I mentioned before. So, okay, and here just like if you're more interested to understand, you know, what is coming. So this exascale supercomputer, uh, you can scan the code, you can go to the website, you will find more information, but basically you see here what we are talking about. We have, we're going to have more than 20,000 upper 100 GPUs of the second generation. So, to meet the demands of uh, our dear friends, uh, foundation model developer. <laughs> And actually, very important, uh, we actually achieved the first place in the Green 500. So, as, mentioned, as you can imagine, there is also a long discussion about okay, we're big, bigger, but what about the energy we consume, right? So, there is also a lot of work done in this to make sure that these systems are also energy efficient. So, we, uh, we have this international list where we also rank the systems in this kind of. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your Any questions before we start putting our hands in the code? <laughs> okay. Uh, do, do you see this trajectory go uh, ongoing? Kind of the general purpose machines and the boosters, or will eventually everything end up on the booster side? Or is that still her? That's a good question. I, I see more and maybe after. So there are different way, different let's say way of you know seeing this trend, right? Um, at the end, you know, we, we will not. I don't believe that we will just at the end end up in just GPU cluster. I think we still have a possibility to, to rely on you know, to, to work on different technology. Yeah, so that are not just computer. But probably we will get more fragmented, right? We will have maybe modules that are more specialized on. Hardware that maybe are more suitable for some particular workloads, and then yeah. But for now, the trend. So for a center like us, we would never like you know, discard other technology, right? 
but our companies probably will just go for yeah. 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 Exactly, but what, what, what was this the trend that we discussed?